it's really something we started. Audio does not sound good. Can everyone go on mute who is not talking? Hello? Perfect. So um, the, the idea of virtual game day is really building off of something that we started a year ago at Rapid. So we had a lot of success. We were able to connect with a number of folks who were doing things in additive manufacturing, had great intentions for what that was going to be this year, but obviously we all understand uh, where we're at. So we're looking to build off of the platform and the idea. We're fortunate enough to um, connect with Link3D, who's been doing some of these different virtual activities in the over the past couple of months and are starting to uh, kind of dip our toe in the water to understand how to run a virtual event, uh, what the value of it is, and, and really how do we get the community pulled together around this you know topic that we're all so interested in. So very happy to have over 300 people registered for the event. So hopefully we'll see more and more of those folks. We have well over 100 or 150, I think, already on right now. So Hopefully we'll see many more uh, filter in. Many of those folks are um, representatives of our member organizations, as well as a number of others in the additive manufacturing community. So what we wanna do is spend the next couple of hours, uh, we have four hours set aside, we're going to do a panel, talk through some of the work that we've been working on uh, with the FDA, the VA and NIH directly related to the COVID-19 rapid response and how additive manufacturing has played a role there. You know, one thing we want to spend and why we've allotted a lot of time on really on the back end is to bring people together. So one thing that we all understand and, and I think get tremendous value out of is having folks come together. We host a number of our own events uh, where we're able to um, reconnect with folks and when we obviously participate in many other events over the course of the year and and we're not able to do any of that right now so what we want to do is utilize this platform as a way to reach out and we'll we'll talk through at the end of this really how that all is going to work but hopefully you're already seeing some folks that you maybe haven't connected with in the last couple of months uh, because of these crazy times so we want to pre present the opportunity to do that in a, a safe and effective manner. So hopefully we all understand the last couple of months have been uh, very different than what we're used to and they've been quite difficult. Uh, hopefully everyone is staying safe and been able to, um, you know, oops, excuse me, um, you know, find a way to respond. And one, one thing that I think we've noticed more than anything is how the additive manufacturing community as a whole um, has really stepped up. You know, we're we're seeing our membership and the additive, you know, larger community play a significant role in the response to COVID-19. Uh, there's quite a bit of activity going on all around us. Um, if we were there virtually, we would give everyone a big, you know, round of applause, virtual high fives. Um, you know, there's there's a lot to be proud of. I think in particular, if we want to focus a little bit more on the business and the kind of tech advancement side of, of what we're doing at the Institute and, and just in the community as a whole, you know, additive manufacturing is, is really having a moment like no other in history, you know, and, and we've heard multiple people say that. We've heard, you know, many different organizations within our membership talk about that. We always hear, and, and you know, five, six, seven years ago, we were the new kid on the block. We were the emerging technology. You know, we were the hot topic. Over the past few years, um, maybe that's Wayne. Maybe some hype has, you know, died off, and other technologies have, you know, started to come into the spotlight. But I think one thing that we've really noticed, and and we're trying to, you know, make sure we're capturing as as accurately as we can is that additive manufacturing has indeed, you know, had more than its moment. It has in fact stood up and responded. It has played a prominent role in the response to COVID-19. So we, we know there's many different organizations who have contributed to that uh, over the course of the last couple of months. You know, some of which are members, others are not. But, you know, one, one thing that we, we've, done and what we've tried to do as part of this event is create an opportunity for folks to, you know, to you get, for you to get a better understanding of what's going on, who's doing what, that really is where the next few hours come in post the actual panel event. We're going to be creating an opportunity to engage. So there is 
you know, if, if you've noticed, and I don't know if you've had the chance to bounce around from floor to floor yet, um, there's many different member organizations that have actually um, created tables. So um, a couple of our folks reached out over the past week as we developed this plan, and we have representatives from a handful of different organizations, Matter Hackers, Honeypoint 3D, Stratasys, Open Additive, Formaloy, the Barnes Group AM Training, General Atomics, Blue Streak, Rolls Royce, Vextex, REM. You know, that's just a portion of the group that is playing a significant role in this response. So it's an opportunity for you to, to talk to those folks, really appreciate their involvement, certainly appreciate the membership's involvement as a whole in this, you know, in the response. Um, we also recognize that there are many, many organizations outside of those that I just, you know, mentioned by name or the stories that we hear on TV. There's, there's, you know, dozens or realistically hundreds of different manufacturers across the country who have stepped up in some way. So one thing that we're wanting to do, uh, in light of that is really tell the, the larger narrative for additive manufacturing and, and how and where has additive played a role in the response for this particular crisis, but obviously then looking forward, what is the opportunity, whether it is related to overall supply chain resiliency or whether it's related to the response to a specific and new uh, crisis that comes up. So I'd like to uh, take a moment and introduce Tiffany Westbay, our membership director at America Makes. She's going to talk a little bit about a the, the start of a new campaign that we're starting at the institute called uh, Membership Mobilization. So I'll hand it over to you, Tiffany. Thanks, John, and hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in today. I'm excited to talk about membership mobilization, and basically, as you see this thing under the Un unveiled throughout the next couple of months, what you're going to see is a strategic communications plan for the membership community. So what we're hoping to do is to increase that engagement between America Makes and the members, but to really capture your story as we move forward. So we know that everybody has been working, you know, tirelessly on this response to COVID. So one of the first things we'd like to do is present the membership community with an online platform where you can upload your stories so that America Makes can then go promote those on your behalf. And of course, we'll give you cost share credit for your participation in that area. Um, but in addition to that, there's several other things that we're going to be rolling out over the course of time here. And another thing that you're going to see is a closer connection between the membership community and the America Makes leadership team. So you can look forward to hearing from our directors and senior program managers as they reach out to you to really try to understand your organization and your needs and how we can play together better in this space. Um, also, another large thing that I'm getting ready to kick off towards the end of the summer is a membership portal. And this is going to be where the members can connect with one another on a regular basis, and we can just keep that engagement strong all throughout the year. Um, one last thing that I'd like to mention, I'm also putting together a membership working group. And this is so that we can hear from the voice of our membership what we need to do to continue to evolve our membership model to continue to be um, meeting your needs on a regular basis. So we do have a table set up. It's on the first floor. It's table 104. So I encourage you during the networking break, stop by and ask questions and just let us know, you know how we can be there to help you. Thanks, John. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Yeah, we're really excited. I mean, one of the most, um, you know, kind of remarkable things that have come out of all of this has been the response. It's it's really the reason that we got involved in the first place. You know, this is we're going into week nine of of this crazy COVID response, and you know, we we've been working very closely with the group that we're going to talk about here in a second. But it all really started because we reached out to members up front to understand what they're doing, how they're responding, ways they, they wanted to help, but weren't sure how to help. And that's really what got us initiated in this, um, in, in the response process and what help, uh, helped us drive uh, to the path that we ended up ultimately taking. So um, thank you, I appreciate everyone kind of understanding and, and look forward to more information coming out, Tiffany. Uh, so up next, I would like to introduce uh, Wooler's Associates. Uh, we have the, fortune of having Terry uh, Woolers participate, and ultimately he's going to help us moderate uh, the panel discussion. So I'd like to uh, bring Terry to the stage, is a virtual stage screen. 
and and Terry's gonna and facilitate the discussion uh, between the four panelists from FDA, VA, and NIH, and, and and myself as well to talk through how our organizations came together to ultimately uh, provide some support against the uh, fight against COVID. So uh, I see Matthew DePrima from FDA on. Hello, sir. Hello. Beth Ripley and Megan McCarthy. Hi, team. And hey. Terry should be joining here, hopefully. Perfect. Terry will be joining uh, for my audio. And Megan, we need you to use one of the audios. Perfect. Great. All right, Terry, are you able to make a sound? Just doing a little sound check here? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Is this all right? This is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, Terry is um, has this internet uh, scenario right now. So he will be his voice will be coming through my image. So um, please ignore my face in here. Thank you. Okay. So the floor is yours, Terry. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, well, hello, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, how's the audio? Is it okay? Uh, is audio all right, everybody? Just want to, yep. yes. Enough. Okay, good. Um, so, so some good news and bad news. The laying down optical fiber throughout Fort Collins, Colorado. So we'll, we'll have a gigabit speed. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. The, the bad news is that it's happening today, uh, last week, this week, and so forth. They severed a cable last week, and I thought, oh, the worst case scenario could happen today. And then what do you know? Just uh, three minutes into the event, and uh, it looks like the, the internet went down. So it may return, but for now, we'll, uh, we'll use the method that we're using. So uh, thanks, everyone, for being a part of this uh, very important program. I'm very excited to, to be a part of it. We have great uh, panelists. Uh, experts in, in their own right and just really thrilled to, to be a part of this. I'd like to, to start by asking uh, a question about uh, the response from America makes, which I, I find very interesting. Uh, can you, John, or anyone really give some background on on uh, what it is achieved today or what it hopes to achieve, achieve in the future? And then also maybe uh, many of us are familiar with the TRL, MRL levels of one to nine. Uh, one really being a concept of an idea uh, of a new product or service, and then nine being, uh, you know, in full commercial service. Uh, and if you could maybe try to rank the, the response to date uh, from one to nine in terms of its maturity, uh, that, that, that'd be great. Uh, so, John or, or whomever would like to, to respond to the question. Sure. No, appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Terry. Sorry we can't see your smiling face. Um, but uh, appreciate you joining and, and moderating this. So the response to date, you know, something that we've coined as the advanced manufacturing crisis production response is really about, you know, how do those motivated manufacturers and designers who want to contribute understand where and how to contribute? And, and we've seen, you know, tremendous interest first and foremost in what we're doing collectively. It's really, like I'd mentioned, what drove us to the point of trying to put all of this together uh, in the first place. We, we knew of, you know, you know, we America Makes knew of the other organizations and this particular skill sets that they have. However, we hadn't, you know, really come together around what a solution would look like. But then as we reached out more and more to our membership, you know, we found out people who were ready to dedicate uh, pieces of equipment, engineers, designs, et cetera, to the cause ultimately. So, so what that forced us to do is, is put together really an idea around, you know, some obstacles that we felt needed to be overcome and then enable us as a community to make a next step. So in, in an attempt to do that, uh, we pulled all of our organizations together. Um, I think we've been working. It's been a pleasure to work with the team for, you know, going on our, our ninth week now. So uh, every day we, we've uh, something we started. 
tagged up and, and uh, kind of talk through what, what the hot, hot button issues are of the day. But through all of that, you know, we on kind of the America Make side and, and really closely partnered with NIH had put together, you know, this idea of an AMCPR portal uh, and a place where validated designs can live. And I think it's honestly been the most impactful activity to date because all of those evaluated designs and, and vetted at some level create a, a level of trust within the community. And really the trust is built off of the backbone that is the testing and evaluation that comes from the VA side of the house. So um, all of that wrapped in some some guidance and or you know exposure to uh, requirements and, and regulatory concerns from the FDA. We've been able to bring that information forward, and I've said this repeatedly, but the whole idea was to lower the barriers to entry for the manufacturing community so they knew where they could engage. I would be lying if I pretended that this was all easy and it's all done. Um, you know, I think we've found quite a bit of success in items like face shields. You know, masks have proven to be harder as you move to more and more complicated components. That's even more difficult. So MRL, TRL level, I think, you know, for face shields, we're, we're high. For other components, you know, high meaning production ready. Uh, for others, we're, we're probably in the five, six zone. I think one thing that we've seen overall is there many of the folks within the community who are responding are not traditional medical um, device manufacturers or folks that are familiar with the regulatory concerns of producing a medical device. So there's been a lot of uh, training and education that has come about out of that. But from a TRL development point of view, we've seen a number of designs iterate and go back and forth and be matured to the point that we're, you know, have designs that we've been able to get put up on the NIH site and they're openly, or excuse me, readily and open to the community to actually manufacture. Great, uh, thanks, John. That's, that's very helpful. Good, uh, good background information. Uh, Dr. Ripley, uh, this, this is for you. What, what were some unexpected successes to date that you can name associated with this effort? Well, I think one of the most exciting and unexpected successes has to do with um, how designs have evolved very rapidly uh, to meet this crisis. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an example. Um, for face shields, you know, face shields have been the, the way they are for, you know, years. Um, but when we were forced to redesign them, several manufacturers paired up with hospital staff. And through that, we realized, you know, there's a few, there's a few important considerations. Like you need to be able to put a mask under that face shield. So you need a step off on, on the, um, the forehead. You know, you need to be able to put, you know, glasses or cer certain surgeons have loops. So you need that step off. But then as you do that, you provide a spot at the top where um, you could have, you know, fluids or something get in. So they then designed on top of that a way to put a visor across it um, so that they could protect against that. And they came up with a really cool, I think, enhanced product. Um, and that happened in two separate instances in two different designs that are on the website that have been really popular across multiple hospitals. And, you know, that happened in the course of days. And I think um, forced to readdress products and redesign products, um, people have been really creative and um, open to talking with the end users and, and that's gotten us some new designs. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ripley. That, uh, that's helpful. It's, um, yeah, if you haven't gone to the NIH 3D Print Exchange, it's something that you should take a look at. It's uh, really well done, I, I think, and I'm sure it will uh, continue to, to grow, expand, and be, become even more useful in the future. So this is for really any one of our panelists. Uh, what are among the biggest challenges this program has faced uh, that you did not anticipate? Maybe some surprises that, that came 
uh, your way over the, the last few weeks. I could say one. Um, I think we did. <laughs> I think personally, at least, we had no idea just how um, big the output would be. You know, there are hundreds, over 500 designs on this website. You know, really amazing work. And I think we were just not ready for the, the sheer number of designs and um, interest in the site, um, you know, hits to the site, et cetera. So we found ourselves rapidly trying to think, how are we going to evaluate hundreds of designs, you know, from a, a very small agile team. So that that was definitely a surprise to me. I don't know what the, the rest of the group thinks. Um, and I, I can add to that. Hopefully, can you guys hear me now? Oh, okay. Technical issues solved just in time. Uh, yeah, so I mean, from the, the implementation perspective of the website, we had a huge increase in in users there was it was it was really great as soon as the fda put out the mou we had 27,000 hits and for us that's a lot so we even had to to bump up our our cloud infrastructure to handle that but it's been really exciting and i'll add to you know what what beth um was saying about the number of entries you know there's been over there's right as of this morning we have 523 um, 18 of those have the um, kind of clinical review, that assessment stamp from the VA. There's 14 for community use. And um, I think it's been really exciting. It's It was a lot. We sort of opened the, the floodgates, but there's been a, a lot of interaction from users. Just even the, the main collection page itself has almost 200,000 views. So it's been exciting. Now, thank you, Megan, for that. I was about to ask you uh, about uh, the numbers and page views, downloads, and et cetera. So you're, you're a step ahead of me. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Matthew, um, does this pathway replace or duplicate uh, duplicate the FDA review process of these uh, of these devices? And you know, how does the memorandum of understanding fit in the FDA regulatory framework? Uh, could you address those two questions? Certainly, and thank you so much for asking those. So I think it's very important for everyone in the community to understand that the products that we're looking at through the NIH Print Exchange and this MOU are ones that would not need, traditionally need a uh, review from the FDA, or in some cases, based on uh, you know current pandemic guidances or EUAs, uh, those pre-market review requirements uh, are being waived. So in normal situations, you know, face shields and some face masks would not go to the FDA for pre-market review. So these are the products that we've really targeted through this MOU. So we're not replacing or creating any sort of parallel review path. You know, as John said, we're really creating this sort of trusted repository of designs and even now manufacturing instructions for these products. So, you know, manufacturers can go and use them with some level of assurance that they're going to perform uh, as they're expected to. Okay, thank you, Matthew. In terms of uh, the impact of the program and printed uh, PPE and other products too, such as ventilator parts, um, what impact has it had on the, the US, uh, uh, well, different uh, US supply chains uh, for parts and, and uh, PPE, uh, PPE products. Now, is, it, is it filling a genuine void? And have you been able to, to, to try to quantify the impact? I'll take a first swing at, swing at that as probably the one who can, um, the safest to answer. Um, the, so, so we've certainly seen it make an impact. And I, and I think it's something that as we look through product prioritization over you know the last few or, you know last month month and a half it's really been been about what is that next problem that can be addressed so i mean we, we've seen it play a significant role and and we've said this already a couple of times in face shields i mean it, it is clearly demonstrating filling a gap in the supply conventional supply chain for face shields we have countless stories 
many of the folks who are doing that great work are on the phone today and I've, I've seen them already pop up in the chat window or you know they have different tables you know we're not the ones producing those components we're trying to make sure people understand what to produce to fill that gap but you know I think overall the technology we've seen it we've seen it show up in a variety of ways we've seen it show up in its you know very traditional prototyping in the very traditional prototyping space so how are we using additive to very quickly iterate on designs that that maybe aren't printed in the long run at all but they're you know rapidly iterated so that we can move them over to injection molding and we, we've seen some good cases of that uh, we've certainly as in the case of face shields and even even face masks um, have seen the space of or, you know the term bridge production so that time between when the uh, existing supply chain um, you know based on our current set of suppliers and the uh, conventional supply chain catches up you know we we've, we've seen additive you know play a, a honestly a major role in that and there's countless good news stories out there about how people are doing that um, you know and then there's some some cases where we're um, actively investigating what AM's long-term role is as it relates to you know either updated or new designs for components so some of those are yet to be proven uh, so we need to uh, watch out how excited we are over them but there's certainly an opportunity uh, in that space to try to quantify it in numbers that's been difficult you know we, we have some uh, understanding of what the folks who've registered through our system have um, identified as capacity. We've certainly seen some of the cases from manufacturers who have, you know, put together success stories on the order of hundreds of thousands of units of, of things like Faith Field. Um, and now you're starting to see, you know, more face masks and things like that. Um, but to give you, uh, here's the number and, and, and where the impact is, that would be a uh, you know, I don't. I don't think we're ready to do that. Hopefully, we'll learn more over the course of uh, today and following days as people kind of step up and self-identify, so we have a better understanding of what that looks like. I think for us, it's very important that we do tell that story, though, because we want people to understand that additive. You know, maybe more so than some other technologies, really stepped up to the call that ultimately leads to, you know, longer-term viability, more investment, more R&D investment more investment in training, being able to pivot a production line more quickly, all of the things that we've seen, both work and areas of opportunity that you know maybe we struggled with but could address through additive. And I could just follow up with just a few um, impactful things beyond just getting um, designs out there. The, the ways that I think that additive has been critical in uh, this PPE shortage and, and other um, aspects are one, um, just as John said, this is uh, untapped manufacturing capability across the country at a time when, uh, you know, the traditional manufacturers are, um, you know, really pressed to put out products. So I think the, the ability to rapidly tap into that manufacturing capacity is huge. Um, second, the ability to kind of turn on a dime for what you're producing. It may be face shields this week, but next week it's masks and the week after it's ventilators. You know, you know, you don't know that ability to be so agile in um, in the manufacturing process is key. And then number three, I think is just um, what I was alluding to before, the rapid design iterations that can be done with additive. And Terry, I'll just add, we've, we've had a lot of emails to, to um, you know, our, through our contact information at this site asking, you know, hey, where can I get these things? Where can I get them printed? I just, I probably have had three or four emails just in the last day or two, you know, from, from people asking, but including this morning, it was someone in South Africa. <laughs> um, so, it, so it's been interesting, too, to see that there is a, a, a global um, interest in this and, and really kind of giving a showing showing the need for it. Uh, yeah, I could not agree more. It's uh, it's good to see so many people networking and, and sharing ideas and problems and solutions to them. So 
Uh, that's great. I think in the future, you know, looking ahead, uh, it'll be even more vital to, to have a better set of metrics to really gauge the uh, the impact of this, so that so that we can plan a, plan ahead. So, uh, my my next uh, couple of questions really have to do with uh, the the segmentation of uh, of how the site is put together, or at least the, the response from America made. So really. The, the three being designers, manufacturers, and then of course uh, ultimately the healthcare providers, the recipients of these parts and products. Uh, and I think this, this question is probably best for John. Uh, how are you trying to provide direction to the design community who wants to provide support? So we have this you know, hundreds, thousands, probably tens of thousands of designers out there worldwide. How are you providing them direction? Uh, so that they can help uh, help with this effort. Yeah, that's a uh, fantastic question, and I think it's something Beth kind of alluded to. You know, having 500 designs is great, and and that is um, you know a a metric. Um, whether they're all you know focused on the right things, and there's a lot of you know the nice thing within those 500, there's a lot of you know riffing if you will off of different designs so there's multiple iterations and improvements and design improvements and fit changes and those kinds of things which you know we, we've seen that get better week after week as we've shared more and more information about you know both what we're looking for and then as we get more info back from the VA on the different testing and evaluation that they're doing that all gets pushed forward um, but you know one thing that we've done through the idea of kind of Bear with me here. I oh, we're back. We're back. So hello, right. everyone. We're live. Okay. Uh, I'm kill the, uh, the phone here, and I think I can do that if I can. There we go. Uh, you're live. Okay. So, so you know, one thing that we we've seen through looking at prioritization of product, meaning what is the next, priori next priority is, you know, one, it was just two weeks, I guess three weeks ago now maybe, um, Beth brought to our team during one of our morning tag ups this feedback around fit of face masks and that although they may be good designs for one person, they may not fit a very large portion of the population. So within a couple of days and, and going back and forth with her team, we identified uh, the idea to put together something we ultimately called the fit to face challenge. And, and the whole idea with whether it's this or you know the next thing, or there's a couple other great challenges out there right now, it's about getting that design community focus. You know, we, we want people who are wanting to work to work on the right things. And that's the most important thing here. We don't need a you know 60 and 70th version of something um, instead we need to get that design community focused on the right thing so this fit the face challenge really focused on uh, putting together uh, responses around a, a series of different characteristics we actually made available and, and through uh, some collaboration with NIOSH they made uh, available to our community the five head forms that they use to uh -huh evaluate fit of face mask and there's you know really just five different sizes from large to small to wide to narrow um, and the challenge to the community was develop a solution that fits as large of a portion of the population as you can and and through that work we were able to and this is all just hot off the presses so we're live announcing um, you know the the designs that were identified as top designs and these are not in any particular order but there were there were three designs that fell into that category um, two of them uh, were something called the moldable mask uh, it was a large version and a small version of the moldable mask and it is uh, by CMU Carnegie Mellon uh, submitted that solution and then the the third is Vader, um, and that is what's classified as a small um, map. And, and we require through this them to submit them against a variety of categories. And that was by Alliance PCB Solutions. So those three, um, we're we haven't even communicated to them yet, as far as I know. So if you're out there, congrats. 
Um, we'll, we'll be providing some more feedback. We have some, you know, feedback on what was great about them, some things that, you know, need tweaked. Uh, there's a couple of things more that, although they had really good fit, uh, there were some other things that need to be um, improved. But hopefully those will turn into designs that we make available to the community here very quickly on the NIH site as well. There were three other groups um, that were classified as kind of honorable mention. Again, there was a large and a small from a, a mass called the FlexFit, and that was by Re3D Incorporated. Um, and then the third was a mask called the Every Mask, um, which was submitted by a team at NIST, actually. So across those six different masks, there were, um, you know, those were kind of the identified as best in class. Um, again, we have some what's good and, and what needs tweaked on those. There's, you know, across the rest of the uh, masks, there were some really interesting ideas. So we'll be feeding back some information to that group as well. But the whole idea is, get the community who wants to help focused on where we need to help um, and then transition to the next item. So we're already talking about what those next uh, transition points are while we're continuing to work through this one. Okay, thanks, John. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great that uh, this, this has come about uh, and I, I'm just hopeful that uh, it continues uh, into the foreseeable future. So speaking of design and then the relationship with manufacturers, what's how does that work? Uh, what's the relationship? Uh, anyone, John or, or uh, any, any one of the panelists could uh, jump in on this. Well, I'll take the first swing since it's probably off of our site mainly that we're talking. Um, okay. so, the, so there's 500 or so manufacturers who have in some way self-identified and went out and filled out this you know, the template for I can make X, Y, and Z. Um, we, again, something like all of this that we rapidly iterated and matured our thinking on as we collected information, we now have that set up where, you know, company ABC can go out and say, I can manufacture this NIH, you know, 013492 at X hundreds or thousands of units per day, per week, or you know, however you want to designate. So we get some understanding of capacity. Ultimately, that is helping us connect to the folks on the healthcare side who are asking for things uh, in, in a similar manner by this particular design, or I need a face shield, I don't care which one it is. It, one of these five are the ones that are approved, so, or you know, have made it uh, through the review process. Let me, I need 10,000 of those. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, the, one of the most powerful things that we've seen, I'd be interested in others' feedback here because we're all getting this communication from people, is whether, whether they're matched through our site or not is not important at all. Whether that matching is happening is what's important. And there are so many stories that we're seeing out there from random town anywhere in the U.S. or really across the globe who are talking about, I use this NIH you know, design. We had a meeting with one of the bigger PPE groups in the country right now, um, last Friday. Almost every single design that they're referring to people is from the NIH site. So that, that's really where the power comes in. People understand that there is a resource, you know, this, this has a lot of powerful implications for the future as well, but there is a resource where I can go and get trusted information and then go and take the next step to try to help somebody or potentially manufacture some goods somebody needs. We're getting some good questions from those who are attending today and one is um, where can we view the preferred fit to face designs? I'm guessing they're not yet available, is that right? No? They are not yet available. The, okay. the intention is we will have a um, you know, information on our site in americamakes.us. Thank you, Amy Good, at fit to face um, And then the as we, you know, go through and, and iterate with, with teams, and there were some really interesting designs that were different than what we had seen uh, from the, you know, previous submissions. Um, the, the intention, and Megan, correct me if I'm wrong, there'll be a flag within the NIH site where you can go very easily get access. 
Uh, thankfully, my wife was in the adjacent room, so I was able to uh, grab her and say, would you please get on the phone with Comcast right away and see what's up with this? And uh, yes, she was successful, so uh, we hopefully will, it'll continue for a while here. Uh, another good question uh, ha has to do with uh, providing these products to healthcare providers. Uh, can you expand to others such as grocery workers and, and other service providers that may come into contact with people? Is that a possible plan in, in the future? Well, I'll, I'll just comment on that, Terry. I think, um, you know, given we have this broad spectrum of people, you know, from industry manufacturers to, you know, maker spaces and individuals who are trying to help fill that gap. And I think there's a real need, there's a real opportunity for the kind of, um, you know, everyday maker and individual to, to fill that gap when perhaps they maybe don't have the, um, the technology or, you know, they, they, they have a, a desktop printer um, and they want to be able to, you know, maybe they don't have the best materials to make an actual mask, a surgical mask, but that they can actually go out and help fill that gap um, when the uh, healthcare workers are trying to get stuff through the, the larger supply chain. So I think there's a lot of opportunities and even, you know, places, you know, besides grocery workers, you know, restaurant servers, um, uh, prisons, things like that, that, you know, are sort of being um, left behind as we're trying to prioritize the healthcare workers. I think it's very important to point out uh, on the NIH print exchange, there is a category for community use. And that's, and yeah, I fully understand the comment about healthcare. And, you know, based off of, you know, NIH, VA, and FDA, we're very much looking at the sort of requirements for using PPE in healthcare or medical purposes. But when, you know, there are uh, looser restrictions when you're not planning on using these in a healthcare setting. And that's where the community use uh, category came in. So while we've been focused certainly on the sort of healthcare and medical side, you know, there are a number of products that are, have been sort of tested and deemed appropriate for community use. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. So, you know, the stakes are, are, are very high when the intended purpose of a device is to provide this barrier from a highly infectious uh, pathogen. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, Dr. Ripley, you can perhaps com comment, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, is this uh, something that, um, you know, how do we deal with this as a community, uh, as, a, as a healthcare worker? I mean, uh, obviously, certain masks uh, are, are, have certain levels of clearance from uh, your organization or another regulatory body, but uh, can, can you provide some commentary on that? So I think, again, the most important thing that we can do is try to give some clarity on which designs are the safest. Um, and that was part of our intent to, you know, moving out of the gate with this. But there's challenge in that because who knows, you know, starting starting from scratch here because, you know, before COVID-19, we were not using additive to make things like face shields and face masks. So I think, you know, it's a balancing act between understanding um, some of the, the limitations and, and the not knowns and um, trying to protect frontline staff. Um, and, you know, we started this with the idea of better than a bandana, um, which I think is actually a, a good way to think about it. Um, and we've kind of refined from there. So one of the, the, the most important things to do, I think, um, and for all the designers out there is to really think about what are the key critical features or elements that these devices need to do. And, and one of the key critical elements for face masks in a healthcare provider setting is to protect against liquids. So, you know, um, blood, sputum, other, other kind of bodily liquids that could be, you know, splashing in the face um, and also um, filtration from bacteria, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we had to rapidly spin up and try to understand how can we test that um, 
and how how do we validate that? Okay, so this is a, a follow up question it came in from one of the participants here, one of the attendees rather. Uh, you know, on the uh, 3D printing exchange from uh, NIH, uh, what was the criteria used for the reviewed for clinical use category? So there's a, two categories, reviewed for clinical use and then the community, broader community use. Uh, what criteria was used for the uh, clinical use uh, PPE? So for the clinical use, the, the first category is, was to look through the FDA emergency uh, regulations or guidelines and understand um, from those documents what was needed for different um, devices. So let's just say masks, face masks, and there are standards that these need to meet. Um, this includes, as I mentioned, liquid barrier protection, um, bacterial filtration. You need to be able to breathe across it, right? So uh, uh, impermeable mask is not useful if you can't breathe, um, flammability, uh, etc. So we started from those features, and then what we added in on top of that was understanding how does it actually work in a clinical scenario. And one of the key features with the VA team is that we took these uh, devices out into the hospital space um, in a controlled way um, and solicited frontline staff feedback. So, you know, can you put it on easily? Is it uncomfortable? Um, does it inhibit you from doing the work you need to do? Um, how long can it last? And so we tried to bring in beyond the standards um, that the device needed to, to meet, we tried to bring in that real world scenario and expertise from that frontline staff to, to truly say, yes, this is not only technically a good product, but I would wanna wear this product. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the key and, and why you see, you know, it takes, it takes a little bit of time to get all of that together, but I think um, it's time well spent to get PPE that not only functions, but that people want to use. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rupert. So uh, we'll talk about PPE a, a lot, but I want to shift uh, at least for a, a couple of minutes to parts for ventilators. Uh, is there a liability in hosting models such as ventilator parts? You know, does does having them on the uh, NIH site give a false sense of security? Uh, Megan, can you address that? Sure. Yeah, this was actually a big topic of discussion because you know part of this 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 effort was help people get access to things that are tested and and safe. And you know, obviously, there's there's quite a big there's there's a very high level of risk when someone is on a ventilator and you're using a part that is maybe um, not necessarily vetted. But um, you know, we have we recognize that this is a global resource. So while these things may not be cleared by the FDA or covered under an emergency use authorization, there's no reason like for us to to stop someone from using it elsewhere where they they are maybe more desperate for resources. And you know, as far as the liability, we see the designs themselves, the files are not harmful. It's really us, you know, we want to make sure that that people understand that this is not, you know, NIH or FDA or VA approved. So it's got a warning label on it, but that, um, you know, at, at least the designs are, are there that maybe people will go and like John was saying, riff on those and, and remix and be able to come up with, um, you know, open source solutions that can undergo more testing. But, you know, we as, as far as putting them out there, I think it, it you know, I'd, I'd like to, to see that just if in the event that it would be useful to someone. And we know the um, the ventilator parts that they printed in Italy when they could not get something from the uh, from the original manufacturer, that that did save lives. Yeah. Can you brief everyone on that? I, I know some of you are familiar with that, but that was one of the first stories I read and I was intrigued by it. And then and then some of the follow up activity that, that occurred as a result of uh, the Italian uh, individual, a small company there who created this uh, valve for this uh, ventilator. Uh, you, you probably took a closer look at look at it than, than myself, Megan, or maybe uh, any one of you. I had a look at it, but I don't know that I that I would want to speak um, authoritatively on the story. Um, you know, I kind of kept up with it, saw what was happening, and that it did have 
have an impact, but um, we've been really mired down with things at this site at that time when it came out. But um, there, there is, um, I believe the valve that they used is submitted, is, is on the, the website. Okay, so it was reported, I don't know, I read about it maybe, it was weeks ago now, uh, that PVA, it's a company in New York, is manufacturing a $6,000 emergency ventilator, which is based on MIT's open source event design that was developed about, I wanna say around 10 years ago. And the company claims it is the very first non-medical device company in the US to receive a fast track certification from uh, the FDA to make ventilators. Uh, do you know when, where, and how this product will be used? Matthew, <laughs> so if you Oh, I am the AM person. I am not the ventilator person. Uh, ah, okay. That being said, the FDA has a very good website on all the emergency use authorizations that it's uh, issued. And we periodically update uh, all of the appendices, uh, especially for the ventilators, with what's been approved, what they've been approved for. So while I am in no position to directly answer that question, you know, the FDA has been very transparent with the emergency use authorizations and all of that, all the publicly available information uh, should be up there. Does anyone else want to comment on how an emergency ventilator is used out in the field? I assume probably not in a hospital, maybe. I, I really don't know, but maybe Dr. Ripley, do you know or? Probably outside of my, I'm a radiologist by training, so. Oh, okay. All right. I don't know either, but um, I, I will say the one thing that has been fantastic over the past, you know, couple of months is, you know, I'm, I'm regularly the one on the call with these other three uh, um, folks who doesn't know this world at all. So I, I speak for the, you know, the, the common manufacturer regularly in asking questions. And ultimately, our, our goal is to try to get answers to things like what you just asked, Terry, so that we can share it. I think the FDA has done a great job in, in trying to communicate. This is all, especially in the early weeks. I mean, it was changing by the day and hour in some cases and guidances were changed or things were, you know, relaxed at some level. And it was, there was no yes or no answer to anything. I mean, it was, it was just complicated, but I, one thing that we've tried to do and you'll, you'll see some changes. We just rolled out some changes on our site. The NIH site has changed quite a bit over the last week and there's a couple more uh, changes coming that really speak to the what should I be making? You know, if I, I'm a manufacturer, you know, I, I've always tried to summarize it in this simple way. I want to help. You know, that's that's at its simplest form. I want to do some good. I can make something, but I don't know where I should be making something. And I might traditionally make things for aerospace or automotive. And I, I have quality systems and I know how to make good components, but I'm just not familiar with this world. I think that's been one of the you know, you, you asked this a little earlier and I was going to answer with this same type of answer. You know, that's been the most eye opening part of this experience. I think the ability to communicate to those, you know, manufacturers outside of the world of medical manufacturers that don't know, like myself, you know, up until a month or so ago or a month and a half, what GMP was. I mean, that, that community, good manufacturing practices, it, it's just not a common terminology, although they very well may have in place a quality system that is very comparable and traditionally manufactures things that go on aircraft. Um, so so being able to, to get that story in the position that people knew where to engage and where they should not engage, because we, we certainly don't want to be part of the stories where people are throwing away PPE that was delivered because nobody knew how or where it was manufactured and if it was safe to use. I mean, we've, we've always stood by the whole reason that we're doing this is to make sure that healthcare workers and now the you know greater public is able to get the product that they need so that they can operate in a safe and effective manner. I mean, that, that's what this is all about. It's been complicated, but you know, I think we've, we've collectively put together some resources to help answer your question. And I, I think an important, um follow up to that 
um, is to think about what we're trying to do. Our intent here is to to try to put some clarity around those those complex questions about how do we make these things? Are they safe or not? I think the bottom line is everything is a risk benefit alternative type of scenario. So you have to think what are the the benefits of what I'm doing and what are the risks um, and weigh those. And I think what we often forget in that um, scenario is the alternatives. Is there an alternative, a viable alternative? And if the answer is there's benefit, there's less risk, there's no viable alternative, then you should do it. Um, and, and I think one thing I would like to message is that our site is there to try to help do some of that, but we are not there to um, approve or, you know, say what you should and shouldn't do. So even if it's not on our site and you've done the benefit risk and analysis and you've got something good, please don't feel that you can't move forward without us. You know, we're, we're here to help. But I think that that's one thing I want to message is that, you know, we can only get through so much at, at one point and, and, you know, we're all, we're all kind of trying to, to figure this out and, and work our way through it. And so at the end of the day, even if it's on our site or not, that benefit risk alternative is really the, the North star for all of this. Good, good point. Well said. One, one, one quick thing, Terry, sorry. You know, that, that is, again, like Beth just said, that's why we got into this in the first place. It was about two months ago, you know, to this past weekend, that we'd talked to a whole bunch of members. They said they wanted to help in ways A through Z, but we didn't know what to go do. We didn't know what regulatory, you know, what the rule space looked like. We didn't know where to go to get access to information. And we had no idea what the demand was really. So where should we contribute? So that, that ultimately got put together in a document that was you know, submitted via a letter to the FDA that said, we need, to, we need to know answers to these questions. We know some folks at NIH, they've got a tool that can help us with this. We've got experience in working with something similar. We can pull the community together. There are manufacturers who are ready to respond. We need to understand how to get engaged, where to get engaged, where to get access to trust the data, and then ultimately, where can I direct my support? And the next day, literally, I got a phone call from the FDA and this all started. And that Monday, we've been on the phone for, this is our ninth week now of talking every single day, kind of trying to come up with this solution. But it was all really about, for uh, the reason we got engaged was because our membership and the additive community wanted and was willing to help, but didn't know how to direct that support. I remember exactly when that happened. That was, the, the, it was right after that Friday that you and I and, and uh, Andrew spoke. And uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, that was, uh, yeah, I'm glad that you went for it because I probably haven't uh, slept much since or, or I don't know, but uh, hey, this is from a, a healthcare person. Uh, I'm not sure what her job is. Her first name is Rena, and she wants to know if if um, if it's possible to take advantage of making custom custom masks and face shields for hospital health healthcare providers. And, and I think she uh, well follow up question: Are hospitals 3D printing masks and shields? I know some are, of course, like a Mayo Clinic. They have a large laboratory, but uh, would someone like to take that, those two questions? So uh, I'll jump in. So I'll have to open with the FDA uh, response first. So uh, that would be a patient or a surgeon matched. Uh, it wouldn't technically be called custom. Um, and oh. right now for some of the face masks and, you know, I, FDA has uh, guidance out and we actually broke all face masks into four categories. Some of those can be made anywhere, non-GMP, you don't need to register and list. Same thing for face shields. So from a regulatory perspective, you can make those products anywhere. Um, I think the real question for a hospital to ask is, you know, is it worth our staff's time and capabilities to be making those products? The sort of next challenge is, you know, AM is a great technology for making patient or surgical matched products. 
That being said, it's still going to be a lot slower to scan, design, and then produce, you know, an individual mask for each surgeon. So I think the answer here is, you know, it really depends on what your facility's needs are. And as Beth said earlier about that benefit risk analysis, does it make sense for you to do it? From both a regulatory and technology perspective, you know, that's pretty straightforward for some of these products, but it really comes down to, does it make sense for you to do that? Okay, this, this also relates to, to making masks. Uh, this is from John, who's with us today. Uh, he starts out by saying, better than a bandana. Uh, is there a way of certifying or claiming better than a bandana? Matthew? <laughs> I'm staring at Beth uh, for that one. Uh, so I I, I, some context for everyone. Uh, in the early days, the CDC released a document on alternatives to PPE. And for face masks, their recommendation was, you know, if you have nothing else available, wear a bandana. So for a lot of the community use and even some of the non-surgical medical face masks, you know, is really to make sure that it's better than a bandana and how you do that. So um, that comes down to the, the testing criteria. Um, and early on in this game, we didn't have access to a lot of the more quantitative tests, um, the ASTM standards that you would need. So, you know, a, a lot of our testing early on was really real world scenarios. Since then, we've gotten more sophisticated. We've found partners um, across multiple organizations, many partners um, within the, the DOD that uh, have helped us to do some more quantifying tests. So how, better than a bandana, right? I think there's two things you want a mask to do. One is source control. So that would be you're wearing the mask to protect everyone around you so you don't spread it to them. So, so that's one scenario. And then there's the mask that you're wearing to protect yourself from getting the virus. Um, those are two different things um, with, with different scenarios. But if, if we go with either one of them, the question it really has to do with stopping um, the movement of, you know, cough, liquids, et cetera, um, through the mask. And so though we have not put bandanas through a rigorous test. We actually are interested in doing that and, and are trying to do those studies now so that we could truly tell you what, what better than a bandana is. But um, <coughs> before we get to that, it's really asking the questions of what is the device have to do um, and then finding the right test to prove um, that it does those things and then you know ranking which which items have met that standard. That's helpful. Uh, my next question is for Megan. Uh, Megan, I think you said your boss is Dr. Fauci, is that right? Uh, so yes, within the NIH, I'm with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So Dr. Fauci is my boss's boss's boss. Um, uh, yeah, and he's he's truly wonderful. We're very, very proud of him and uh, every, everything that he's done over the last, um, wherever we are now, three, four, or we're going into month five of this, he's, he's really fantastic. Yeah, so, so the question is this, um, where did it go? Ah, so what is the value of the NIH 3D print exchange uh, rather than an open re repository, such as, you know, Thingiverse, Pinshape, GrabCAD, and, and there's a host of others. So we actually, we launched this site and um, uh, it was in 2014. So 2013, you know, this idea started bouncing around that that we saw all these other sites and there, there, there just wasn't a lot of sort of biologically relevant and kind of scientifically accurate models. And then also um, we wanted we wanted a place that would sort of target the scientific and medical community and um, also support custom uh, custom labware. So, so that was kind of you know where we were going, and given the, the feedback that we got from the advisory board and building that and other users, was it the idea of having you know a unique database identifier and something coming from the NIH to with the idea that it has a little more kind of um, 
authority, if you are, you know, publishing in a manuscript linking to that, rather than somewhere else, um, you know, that that ID doesn't doesn't necessarily, you know, not everything on the, on this site is coming from the NIH or is reviewed. And I'm talking about the site um, overall. But um, yeah, I think it, it's been interesting to see people really having value in this being you know, coming from a resource such as the the NIH that has been kind of validating and um, like Beth said, you, you know, people should go and print whatever they want, but just the idea that this is, you know, an NIH supported resource um, it seems to, you know, our feedback is that it, it, it um, that there's value in that. Sorry, I have to be the FDA person on the panel. When Megan says people should go ahead and print whatever they want, um, it's going to be within you know what's appropriate and within the label and you know within what you know the current regulations allow. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Uh, here's the thing. So, so one thing that we actually, in order into to support that, that'll come out today or tomorrow through us and, and you know, we'll gonna be shared with NIH is, and we've worked back and forth is, you know, what are those considerations that I need to have? There, there's still no matter what, some some basic requirements for most items, unless you're giving it to, you know, in replacement of a bandana for someone going out to the grocery store. But if it's gonna be used in a certain setting, you know, they still need to be labeled properly. They still need to be tracked properly. There, There's some, you know, what are very basic things that the community that does it every day are maybe not um, front of mind for those who are just trying to help. So we actually put something together together. We put something together with NIH um, to try to respond to that. And it's just simple. It, it didn't end up being, I think, the top 10, but it's the top 11, um, you know, things you need to consider when you're wanting to do good. So it's some, some of those basic things to make sure you're covering your bases. I was going to say this question uh, toward the end because I have a group of questions that really look look into the future, and but but I'm going to ask this one now because six people have voted in favor of uh, of us addressing it. Uh, do we think this activity, the the activity of America Makes and and these regulatory and other agent healthcare agencies, uh, will create a change on the medical industry adoption? Uh, given you know additive manufacturing can do things not previously considered or previously uh, possible. So uh, I think that's going to be a little bit of a hard one to address because the medical, uh, or at least the medical device industry, has already very much adopted AM um, across a number of areas. I mean, if you look at sort of orthopedic devices in general we see a huge number of products uh, being made. And I mean, we're talking, you know, serious in medical implants, um, you know, hearing aids, uh, dental uh, are mostly made using AM today. Uh, the dental industry has been huge adopters of AM. So I, I think, you know, if we were to sort of break this down, I think there's some segments of the medical device industry that are more likely to consider AM as a result of this pandemic. But generally, you know, the medical industry has already, you know, been significant adopters of this technology over the last five years. Good point. I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll just add that, um, you know, we've, this is not, a, this supply chain gap is not something that, you know, this isn't new. This, you know, we encountered this in the H1N1 epidemic in 2009 and um, to a lesser extent Ebola in 2014. And um, I think the lessons learned that come out of this, now that we have, you know, AM technology is much more widespread, the ability to be able to kind of pivot from whatever you were making before to be able to, you know, ramp up production on, on something else in a different way. I think the lessons learned that come out of this and being able to mobilize very quickly are, um, it, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. And, whether or not this continues with AM on a, a, a regular basis, but uh, you know is is undetermined. But it does it it does prove that in future, when there is this gap, there will be sort of the um, the guidance will be able to respond uh, more quickly to to give the the manufacturers 
more information faster, the designs, the instructions on what they can do to fill that gap. Um, Cause like John said, there were people that had capabilities that didn't know exactly what to print or who to get it to. So I think this is, I think this is gonna be really impactful in the long run. Hopefully we're never in this situation again, but um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what comes from that. I'm, I'm excited to, to learn that. Uh, agree, uh, totally. So this is from Cynthia. Uh, she says that John mentioned looking for the next big item that might be needed. Uh, I read this weekend that there could be a critical shortage of syringes once a vaccine is found. Is this something that could be uh, and then the rest of the message, let's see, can I read it? Uh, it stopped there for me anyway. So um, I think we I, I think we have enough of it though. Does someone want to, to talk about the, the production of, of syringes? <laughs> Not all at once. I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in quickly. You know, some of this comes down to, you know, we have AM, but you know, you could print it, but should you print it? And how much could you scale that up? So I think it would depend on materials and, and what your capabilities. I mean, if you can injection mold something, you'll get there faster. But, you know, obviously we're seeing that if things are happening in a, in a pinch, I think with syringes, it would probably come down to materials and, and what kind of printer technology you're using that, that you, you know, have something that is sterilizable and reliable structurally for those yeah. purposes. Yeah, I mean, it really comes down, like you say, does it make sense? You know, 3D printing is a good fit for many types of parts and products, but not all. And this may or may not be a, a good fit. Um, uh, let's see, so do we think this activity will create change? Ask that one already. Here's what, here's another one. Bless you, John. How was this initiative affected, uh, or ha how has this initiative affected the site, the NIH site? This is really for you, Megan. And how might you do things in the future on the uh, NIH? NIH uh, 3D print exchange. So, so it's been um, an interesting exercise for us because I, I mentioned, you know, the interest, really the open source hardware community was really focused on custom labware. So how can you MacGyver the, um, you know, the equipment you need for your experiment in a really custom way? We had never really thought about putting a label on things. You know, the terms and conditions are, you know, don't be upset if this breaks your $100,000 centrifuge, you know. Um, but now, you know, we're kind of looking at things and saying, well, if we get more of these devices, you know, like ventilator parts and things that we're not quite sure about, you know, that we will have to put a label on those. And, and that was something that we kind of never really had to do or hadn't considered before, you know, everything sort of use at your own risk. But I think as we as we go into this, you know, people sharing the open source medical devices, we really are, are going to have to think a lot more, a lot more carefully about that and, and how we give people the right information. Which is why we're so lucky to have a direct line to the FDA. Yes, yes. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Matthew, I think you may have shared this with me uh, as a public private partnership, what are the differences in engaging government and industry entities? Uh, now, we're referring to America Make, so this is, uh, I think John will probably be in the best position to answer this, but what are the differences in engaging government and industry entities now during a pandemic versus a non-pandemic uh, circumstance or circumstances? Did you get that, John? But you're asking Matthew. I was wondering how he was going to respond to that. Um, <laughs> no, I mean it, it is it is you know the, these are admittedly our organizations that we've we've worked with at some level on you know very specific things in the past, but never at the level we are right now. I think the you know the, the value that we've been able to play has been that or hopefully is um hopefully others are seeing it this way is the bridge between the organizations and and they certainly work very well together and and know each other for for years outside of us being involved in any way but i, I think 
us sitting off to the side, we have the ability and we talk very regularly to our membership community and those from industry who are producing components, who have questions. It was eye-opening, I'll say the le to say the least, I guess, when, when this all first started, I would have companies with, you know, four and five and six employees calling up, asking almost the same exact question as a Fortune 100 company. You know, the, the biggest players in the, you know, in, in AM, we'll just say generically. Um, you know, I think that put us in a unique position to be able to take that input from the community, whether it's, you know, part manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, material, to be able to be the voice of that community and bring it forward to the folks who are, you know, working through these scenarios and decision making and guidances, et cetera. Granted, that, that doesn't in any way circumvent the process of a manufacturer has got an idea that they take to the FDA. That's not, you know, we're, we're, we're not breaking the system or trying to change the system per se, but I think the, ha the ability to have us pivot and talk to both sides you know, of that public-private partnership helped it, you know, hopefully make things move along uh, more quickly than we could have otherwise. So, so this is an interesting question from John. Uh, this is John without an H. Uh, America Makes is paving the way for additive manufacturing businesses, underscored, uppercase, bullface businesses. But what about additive manufacturing humanitarian volunteers? underscored uppercase boldface humanitarian volunteers a potentially enormous global resource take a swing at that um so since our name was in the the, the lead-in um so i think that's one thing we've admittedly I don't want to say struggled with, but we've we've been working through because we're we're not that connected to that community, and and we're certainly, um, you know, interested in in not just their voice, but what they're doing and where they're trying to help, and and we've seen an overwhelming um, involvement on the humanitarian side, and we we've you know talked to a number of the groups who are directly focused at purely the humanitarian side of things, um, you know at at the end of the day, the product that they're delivering needs to be safe and effective. That, that's ultimately, we're all operating under the same guidelines that we're producing components, whether you're giving it away, doing it at cost, or making a business out of it, we're all, we all need to follow the same guidelines. And I think that's something that we have from the very beginning uh, kind of instilled within our group um, you know, across our teams and, and the folks that we're working with to make sure that um, we stay focused and go work on those, you know, the right next thing is, is really how we focused on, especially early on is we, we don't know what's going to happen two and three days from now. You know, we need to just answer the next question and really trying to serve as a resource to share that information the best we could. And admittedly, I'm sure we fell down across along the way, but you know, we, we it was changing so rapidly and still continues to, you know, we're, we're trying to work the best we can. Nobody wants to be doing this work. I mean, that's that's something that I think everyone has realized that this is, um, you know, has been a fantastic response, but it's not necessarily what anyone wants to be spending their time doing um, specifically focused on this problem. You know, it's key now to, to transition that and how do we recover and become more resilient. Um, you know, so, so I think the most valuable thing that's come out of it has been the kind of trusted repository that whether you're looking to donate it or build a group of folks to come together to make X number of units for your local hospital or to send overseas, it, it's still all about that trusted design and data. Um, or if you're looking to, you know, manufacture to meet a need, that that's fine. So I think we our stance doesn't change. Um, not no, sure if that directly addressed their question or not. No. Okay, this is from Mike. Uh, he asks, uh, as a, a new startup in the 3D printing space, uh, how does one go about producing products for FDA, NIH, and the VA? All right, 
So I'll start. So I think the first thing to understand is you're outside of things that the NIH and the VA are buying for their own sort of clinical use. Right? We're not talking about producing products to be used by us. Right? We're really looking at trying to sort of fill the gap for these low risk products. So uh, on the America Makes website, there is a manufacturer sign up. Uh, portal so you can sign up and say these are what our capabilities are these are the products we can make some rough numbers so in one sense you know that's how you can go about getting involved on the other aspect you know if you're interested in submitting designs you can do that through America makes or you can also do that through the NIH print exchange now the one caveat is you know these are going to be those low risk products that I already mentioned that don't need a traditional FDA review if you need a traditional FDA review or if you need emergency use authorization, uh, that still comes through the FDA, the traditional pathways. Megan, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, I think, you know, it, it is important. Well, and I don't want to, Matthew, jump in and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. But um, I believe from our discussions before is that to get that um, certification of good manufacturing process, Good manufacturing practices to make some of these devices, you know, after these emergency use, uh, sorry, emergency use authorizations, the EUAs, you know, are um, when this emergency is over and those are those are rolled back, so they're not no longer waived. Um, that there is a process for that that I I don't believe is is necessarily prohibitive to a, a startup or you know a, a group that wants to go in and continue doing this um, as their main line you know as a, as a line of business so Matthew you can correct me if I'm wrong or maybe comment on that process I, I I'm not going to try to quote the statistics that I don't fully remember but a vast majority of the met, of the regulated medical device industry are small companies so there's a lot in place to make it accessible and easy for small companies to engage and interact with the FDA. And I think what we're actually, what this conversation is sort of underscoring is manufacturing medical devices is complicated. Through this MOU, we've tried to sort of decomplicate it for certain spaces of products. But at the end of the day, when you're manufacturing medical devices, you're manufacturing medical devices, and there's a lot of FDA regulations around that activity. Yeah, but please don't be scared. You know, we're here to help both through the MOU and at the FDA, these you know very needed products can make it to the market or the clinical space. I'm going to shift now a bit more into the future. Uh, do you see long-term sustainability or sustainable uh, business models being created using AM as a result of the pandemic? Let me repeat that. Do you see long-term sustainable business models being created using additive manufacturing as a result of the pandemic? So I'll just, I'll step in there with a comment. Um, you know, this is so, um, you know, we really don't know where we're going with this, like how long we all will be wearing surgical masks you know, or not necessarily sort of, but but face masks or or something. These community use even um, to to the grocery store when you know we're interacting with others. Um, I think that's still, you know, things are starting to to reopen. We'll say we don't know. I mean, a vaccine um, would be January, I think, it or at the earliest. So it, I think it's interesting to see in this very the, the way the economy is right now are the say like small businesses or, or other groups that are jumping in to fill this gap is um, it, maybe that will become something that that allows them, you know, does that does that become a, a way for them to, um, you know, replace whatever business they were doing before, um, you know, even for there's been upholsterers who have started, you know, switching from, you know, people aren't concerned about, you know, their furniture right now, that making surgical masks and will there be a transition and, and something that, that may actually help bolster the economy for, for some of these in some of these areas in manufacturing. 
Yeah, I, I think the jury's still out on specific products. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of interesting innovation as a result of device shortages. So the question is going to be, you know, in a year when traditional manufacturing has sort of caught up, you know, do those innovative designs that you can only make using additive, you know, are they still cost effective and then do they stick around? I think the distributed manufacturing approach that AM brings is also going to be very attractive, especially when you start thinking about, you know, can we bring things on board? And, you know, this was very much a global pandemic. But if you think of regional disasters, you know, if you have one plant making all of your products and, you know, there's a you know, earthquake, hurricane, you know, massive blizzard that shuts you down, you know, does the distributed manufacturing approach suddenly start looking more attractive? So, yeah, you know, I think there's lots of changes that you know AM could bring based on people's experience from the pandemic. Uh, I think we're too close to you know fully understand what's going to happen. Yeah, you mentioned the distributed manufacturing, and a lot of people uh, have asked about you know what 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 makes 3D printing different than conventional manufacturing in the uh, you know, at, at this particular time of a pandemic, and you know, certainly that is one. And, and of course, uh, I think you mentioned or someone earlier about the ability to very quickly iterate new designs and get something in your hands quickly. And 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 once you have that design, then you can start manufacturing product. You don't have to wait for tooling or or some supplier uh, to to respond. You can go to work on it right away, assuming you have access to equipment and materials and you know how to operate them. So it really does provide you know some some unique benefits, and hopefully we can learn from that. Hopefully, uh, this will develop a, a sort of a supply chain to what you're doing uh, together, so that if if this happens maybe at another time, or even in another uh, situation entirely that we have not foreseen, that uh, you know you'll have a lot of the parts in place to to be able to to respond uh, more quickly. So related to that, uh, do you think that this will have a broader impact now that companies see how supply chains can be disrupted? Because I think a lot of it's just, we, we take a lot of these things for granted that we can just get this stuff, whether it's food or, or medicine or PPE, that it's just there and we can get it. Uh, now that we, many of us uh, have maybe a better appreciation for this uh, supply chain disruption, uh, do do you see that AM as being a solution for other products in industries besides uh, uh, healthcare uh, type products? Yeah, so I, I think you know we're we're certainly seeing this when when this all first got started. We talked about a lot about distributed manufacturing and where does additive fit in, and I think we're all plenty um, aware that additive is a manufacturing process that needs to be paired in, in most cases with other. Um, there's certainly opportunities where it stands alone more than it does, you know, depending on what the response is. But, you know, ultimately we know there will be more disruptions, whether they're related to a crisis or, or something else. Um, there's going to be disruption. Additive has already proven that it can make an impact here. What we, you know, for this particular type of, of um, issue, what we need to think about is what is, you know, what is our preparation process for future crises look like? How do we identify what the roadmap or strategy ultimately look like? How do we have in place something like a, you know, model repository, you know, so for this situation, NIH has been an invaluable resource and we would not be able to, you know, people would not be able to deliver the product that they've been able to without it. So looking back at, or looking at developing an after action report or lessons learned, how do we make sure that we start to at least start the discussion and then put in place those things so that we have this type of, you know, digital seed bank or however you want to describe it, but something where the items are that you can, get access to and there's lots of access controls and information around you know how much data is involved in the tech data package and those kind of things but ultimately we need a plan we need a roadmap we need a repository we need a playbook we, we need to figure out how to go and execute against this thing however at the same time that's you know what is good for crisis um, 
response is certainly good for supply chain resiliency. So right now we're working through this, you know, response portion of the problem. Hopefully we're moving into the recovery portion of this this COVID response. And ultimately looking forward, we've we've got to be positioned that we're looking into the resiliency side of things. So I got asked here and last week by a couple of different folks, you know, as we're talking to some different folks in Congress who are talking about some bills and legislation, you know, how do we utilize this and, and what is the potential impact to your point of just general you know, ability of a supply chain to be more agile? How, did, how do they respond based on a demand that has nothing to do with whether there was an earthquake or, a, you know, a, you know, health issue, but their business needs to pivot very quickly? What can we learn from this to make sure that we're better able to do that? And ultimately, you know, where does additive fit in? Where does digital data fit in? They, they all fit very nicely together. Additive happens to be a way to get your head around how to use that digital data and ultimately produce a component. So tons to learn here. I think ultimately we've got a lot of focus on what we're doing. We need to look forward at how do we scale that up? Like how do we actually build it into some enduring infrastructure that we can take advantage of in the long run? And then how do we pressure test that whole system and, and exercise capability so that we're not, you know, building it as we, you know, try to fly it like we have all been uh, for the past couple of months. Wow. Good point. So this next question is from Prabir, but before I ask it, well, this question has to do with uh, mobilizing hospitals to take on more 3D printing. And the last I read, and it might have been from you, Matthew, or someone else, that uh, 160 hospitals now have some form of 3D printing capability within the hospital. Uh, is that number fairly close to being accurate? Uh, at this point, that number seems low. Yeah, could be. Uh, so uh, outside of COVID, uh, the FDA has been spending a lot of time working on figuring out how to ensure that uh, manufacturing, specifically 3D printing at the point of care, is done under the most appropriate way. Because, you know, lots of hospitals are doing this. Uh, the FDA was floating around a proposed sort of policy framework. Uh, we've actually been getting a lot of good input from people. The I'd say the one perk to you know the COVID response is we're seeing a lot more hospitals get very interested in this, and we're hoping we can sort of learn from the community uh, about their experiences with this. Now, I'll say an upside to this is most of what hospitals are currently printing are falling in that very low risk category where sort of anyone can print it. It's gonna be much more interesting when hospitals want to start printing uh, higher risk products. And then we're going to have to sort of get a better, better understanding of sort of the existing regulatory space that hospitals are under, educate them about what the FDA requirements are. And, you know, in a perfect world, you know, there will be multiple sort of regulatory options that a hospital could decide to go with based off of, you know, what the broader industry support is and the specific products that they want to make. So, so higher risk products such as uh, orthopedic implants, for example. Uh, you know, certainly implants. Uh, there are some, uh, and you know, I always cringe when I start talking about surgical models because that gets very confusing for people, but there different ways to use surgical models and those dictate, you know, the level, appropriate level of risk. Uh, specifically for surgical models, there are cleared FDA software that if you use it, that you're, if you use it per its label, you're the user of a medical product, um, which provides some clarity. But, you know, we're looking at everything from uh, implants to cutting guides, um, most prosthetics already fall outside of the realm of what you would need, but if you make them fancy enough, you might need, uh, they, the classification would increase. So we're trying to be more agnostic to specific products and try to sort of say, based on the benefit risk profile and the regulatory classification of these products, these are ways that you as a hospital could sort of make these products. With the end goal of making sure that, you know, a, we never want a patient to have to ask, is this traditionally made, is this 3D printed, and or is this 3D printed at the hospital? They should have the same level of assurance about that product quality and safety. Okay. 
by the way, the 160 hospitals, those will be in the U.S. only. So there's, I'm sure, many outside the U.S., uh, but but just within the U.S. So, but like you say, it's, it's probably a low number because that might have been published uh, more than a year ago. So so back to Prabir's question, following on the future 3D printing for healthcare, uh, the, the healthcare industry, is there an NIH or America Makes effort to encourage, motivate, or mobilize hospitals to take on more 3D printing activities? So I'll, I'll just say, you know, as, as far as what we've been doing um, uh, with my group, the, the NIH 3D Print Exchange, that we've been really trying to just kind of help raise adoption and um, but, you know, I've, I've been involved with several working groups the last couple of years, especially with Matthew and with Beth um, and others, um, but just just trying to get more of this out there and help people. It's, you know, several years ago, it was just the Wild West. People were getting 3D printers and kind of going off and, and um, it was it was exciting to see that innovation in technology. But also, like Matthew said, you kind of have to. To, to make sure that everyone knows exactly what they're doing. Um, so the NIH doesn't really have any specific um, a, a specific kind of campaign for this, but I'm certainly involved in some different working groups and trying to keep our finger on the pulse of things that, that we can help facilitate that, that moving forward. Good. John? Um, yeah, so, I mean, admittedly, this is an area where, you know, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of activity, although I'll tell you, a year ago, it was at Rapid, you know, a handful of orgs kind of reached out and started asking questions. You know, we, we know there's, you know, quite a bit of activity going on in this space, but I think from, from our point of view at the Institute, um, although we tried a few years ago and we did and some preliminary road mapping specific to medical and what does it mean and what are the roadblocks? Um, we, we haven't had a lot of activity in that space since then. So like uh, Megan mentioned, there's a number of different groups out there working this. Um, there is a workshop that we're participating in or you know part of with, I think probably quite a few others on the phone. Uh, the AM medical workshop that ASME is putting on here in, I guess, 16 days or somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, you know, one thing that we're trying to do as part of that is is collect inputs and whether it's through that group or other groups, and there are a handful doing this, you know, we want to get that information and then align it back to our roadmap so that we're better able to, from a, a national tech development roadmap point of view, understand where we're at, what are the, you know, are there design limit, you know, restrictions that are preventing us from being able to do that? What are the, you know, qualification certification is always the big sticking point for insert any industry here, um, you know, kind of problems. Uh, we, we are looking and will be uh, increasing activity from the Institute's point of view in that in the coming months. Good, good. Uh, so, do you see the response from America Makes as something that will continue into 2021 and beyond? So, the, you know, direct to COVID, I, I pray that we're not still dealing with it and, I mean, even orders of magnitude smaller than, than what it's been lately, honestly. From a what are the kinds of things that an institute should work on and how do we better focus on convening, coordinating and catalyzing an industry around problems? Yes, absolutely. I think we've, you know, in, in some cases as an institute, we were well positioned and hopefully we, we've stepped up at, at some level and, and done some good along with, you know, working, you know, ultimately through membership and the other government agencies. There's also things that I think we've realized now that we're starting to collect as part of this lessons learned that we're not, we haven't been very well positioned to do. So we're taking a hard look at what that is um, to directly answer the question. I think we, if required to still have uh, the ability to match folks and make available information, we will find a way to do that. I certainly hope 
we're not doing the same thing, but we're instead looking at how are we implementing the technology and recovering and working on supply chain resiliency more and doing that as a community. So we're focused on the right thing and then ultimately sharing that information so others and, and the community at large benefit. Uh, this question is from Pete. Uh, Pete asks, do you think manufacturers will invest in supply chain risk management solutions to provide a competitive advantage? Uh, will, will government apply pressure on companies to demonstrate uh, the supply chain risk management uh, res resiliency? Maybe from our uh, government uh, friends, Megan or Matthew? That's outside of the FDA purview. Yeah. John or Megan, were you shaking your head or? I mean, the, the, the NIH does not, um, we actually don't put out any kind of regulatory guidance per se. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I'm, I'm not sure what would come into to play there, but. Okay. So, so this, this question, I've been wanting to ask for some time. We, we touched on it a while back, maybe toward the first 20 minutes or so. It's from uh, Mara, and she asks, can you describe the impact of the demand side of the America Makes platform? What hospitals have, um, what have hospitals been requesting and how much of that demand has been met? Uh, met, and then you know any learnings or insight that you can that uh, we can provide as a result of this effort would be would be appreciated. Yeah. So thank you, Mara, and thanks. You guys have been doing a ton of awesome work. Um, and one of the earliest designs to get on the the site. So. Uh, to answer the question, though, you know, this has honestly been the most complicated, well, one of the more complicated sides of, of what we're trying to do. Uh, the demand signal has not been very pure. Um, it has been even even in cases where institutions have reached out, um, we've found, you know, they've they've found difficulty in, in procuring things outside of their conventional supply chain. So certainly depends on how urgent the need was. Uh, obviously, as the urgency went up, um, they figured out how to knock down some of the roadblocks. But I mean, we, we have not seen a tremendous um, level of, you know, inputs into the system. I don't know what the exact number is we're right at right now, but it's in the hundreds of low hundreds of thousands of units. Um, although we did just get a big request uh, yesterday. Um, primarily, face, well, almost exclusively face shields and face masks. And also we, we've seen a, quite a few um, ear um, strap tensioning, I can't remember what we call those, but uh, you know, between those three items, that is the, yeah, the comfort straps, that, that is kind of the highest level of interest, the way we've been dealing with it because recognizing we're not in the position to go off and go let specific contracts out um, to answer a question is, you know, it, it's been a little bit difficult. So we, we make as this, this most recent ask was 100,000 face shields a month. You know, we are identify manufacturers. Typically we're, we're trying to do it in a, in a geographic region because it just makes the most sense recognizing that it's a regional fight and we're, we're seeing it all over the country. Um, you know, we, we would then say, here's the 10 or 12 or 15 manufacturers who have raised their hands that have direct capacity to address your need. And then we ask them, you know, hand over that information, they go follow up. We then, you know, reach back regularly to try to understand where they're at. In some cases they've, um, you know, found conventional sources. So it eliminated their need. In other cases, they've been matched. Um, we're not directly seeing the one-to-one. -one. Is it a 50% hit rate? You know, we've, we've, like everyone, everyone's been so busy, you know, we reach out a lot and haven't heard back whether they've been successful or not. So uh, we certainly have cases where it is. Um, I think our best cases, honestly, are from the membership side of things where they are themselves off and working with their local hospitals or a system or network 
to get those answers. Um, so, you know, we've, we've tried every angle you can imagine from dealing with FEMA to the regional directors to the state level to local platforms, you know, without a national approach, it led everyone to go off in a different direction. So we've been just trying to reach out as many ways as possible to make sure they knew the capacity and, and capability that existed. And then we passed that information directly over. We have time for maybe two or three more questions. And this is one that's uh, well, uh, thought provoking. Uh, you can agree or disagree with the sort of the genesis of the question or, or what's behind it, but uh, I'm gonna ask it, uh, even though it might be uh, somewhat uh, uh, controversial. Uh, biology aside, this crisis suggests that our medical, industrial, regulatory infrastructure has been deficient. Beyond temporary, temporary relaxation, what needs to be fixed? Uh, so I'm going to step back and say, you know, broadly speaking, the FDA has been watching with some level of concern with the uh, sort of challenges, especially on the drug side, right, where if you have one facility making a critical drug, you know, suddenly that supply chain becomes very vulnerable. So I think, you know, this has been sort of an ongoing issue as you know, things consolidate and you, we sort of become highly reliant on a few locations to manufacture critical products. Outside of sort of recognizing the need and, you know, I, I always cringe when drug people speak to devices. So I'll now of course speak to the drugs. I know my colleagues on the drug side have been very interested in making sure that, you know, there are alternatives to some of these supply chains or we can work with people to ensure that there's sufficient capacity to make, you know, critical drugs when there are shortages. Um, outside of sort of those efforts, you know, I'm, it's, you know, the FDA's job is generally to make sure the products coming to the market are safe and effective. We do less on the side of making sure that, you know, the products can be manufactured. So I think it's a tricky question that has a lot of economic as well as sort of regulatory factors uh, sort of stacked on each other. Hey, Megan or John? I was going to let you go, Megan. Um, um, I, I don't. I don't have anything to to speak to that, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the NIH. So yeah, I do? no, so. no. I th I think the the what Matthew brought up is the one area, and you know, we, we capture it all in in general, you know, terminology of of supply chain resiliency and where are we at, and what you know, what should we be considering? Um, we certainly know and have seen some of the cases that have happened before our eyes and potentially put us in a, a very vulnerable position. And, you know, that can be the case, whether it's because of this type of, you know, component or some other, I mean, we've seen it happen um, to, to all types of supply chains because of natural disasters and, and things like that, where it kind of cripples a, uh, an industry. Um, so I, I won't comment on regulatory changes that need to be done to, and you know, better distribute that. However, I think we're certainly seeing a increased interest in, you know, how do we enable, you know, manufacturers to be agile enough and, you know, competitive enough that you can make that uh, a viable option. And, and certainly a lot more goes into it than that, but, you know, I think that's the side of things that we're looking at more so than you know, what what we believe should be changed in uh, regulatory policy. No, thanks, thanks, guys. I, I appreciate it. Uh, so, so this has to do with public-private partnerships and and distributed manufacturing. Are are we going to see uh, more of both in the future, both in and outside of disaster scenarios? So I'm I'm hoping that we're uh, a 
test case of how public-private partnerships can be valuable and where they can help bring together, you know, all sides of the you know, community in a response. And you know, we know that what works here isn't necessarily have anything to do with what's going to work in another area. So. I would imagine you know, that there is a lot of opportunity. I think more than anything, one thing we know we can control is our ability to collect the, you know, I've said it a couple of times now, but you know, after action report of, of what has worked and where were we well positioned and where are we deficient. I think it is enabling, it, it will enable us as a group of manufacturing innovation institutes, both in the De Department of Defense and more broadly across Manufacturing USA to understand where we fit in. And certainly we've understand or discovered some things that we're not very well positioned to deal with right now. So I think, um, I, I hope the answer to that is yes. And we've proven that uh, there is value. And I think we have opened, you know, collectively, I will not take any of the claim for this, but uh, opened a lot of doors and got a lot of people connected through this process. And I think it, you know, we're in a unique position to do that where a direct government agency, you know, that, that's more difficult um, from time to time to do that. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll come out of this um, better off and have a better documented process or playbook on how we, you know, ex execute, sorry, uh, in the future. I want to add to that, Terry, you know, just in general, I don't think there's no way this effort could not have happened without these four different groups coming together. You know, none of us really could have done this on our own. So I think it's a great example of, you know, not just industry and government, but also um, in interdepartmental and interagency within government, um, just that, you know, we said it's kind of... NASA interested in, in helping out in some ways and then of course different groups within the Department of Defense we said it was like Avengers assemble because it was just these different groups and everyone has their own niche and their own role to play and I think um, you know there it's, it's certainly necessary to have all those aspects and industry is I think there's a very important role um, that you know government can do a lot but we can't do everything yeah. My sort of uh, final thought on this would be you know, FDA has been, uh, been a member of America Makes for years now. Uh, we're very involved with Nimble. We're involved with the other institutes. And you know, between this team, I mean, FDA, VA, and NIH have been talking about 3D printing for what, seven years, eight years now? Like, I mean, we are very sort of interconnected. So it was sort of an easy ish step for us to take those pre-existing relationships and bring them together. And I think the big thing that America Makes brings is, you know, they're tied in with a lot more people than we are. And they're able to sort of make a lot of introductions and bridge, you know, the, the relationship gaps that we didn't necessarily have before the pandemic. Yeah, good point, Matthew. Uh, we have one more question, but I, I first want to thank uh, all of you, uh, Megan at NIH, Matthew at FDA, uh, Beth Ripley uh, at um, VA, and of course, uh, John at American Makes for making this possible. You provided a great deal of insight. Uh, we appreciate it very much. The final question is, um, I'd like, if you would, all four of you to weigh in on this. Uh, no matter if you've been in it for in into 3D printing and, and additive manufacturing for a few years or, or many, many years, will we look back at this time as a turning point in the AM industry? I'll go first. Yes, I, I absolutely think that we will. I think I was so caught up in what we were doing um until just a couple of weeks ago and we you know we're able to pick our head up for a second and we were in a meeting with a, a series of different members and and we started talking about this very topic and you know i, I absolutely think that we're going to come out of this we have proven the validity of the technology somebody in that meeting 
phrased it as, you know, we're not up just about trinkets, you know, and, 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 you know, our circles who, who understand the technology, you know, that's long since been a concern, but we still fight it. You know, if, if you go out there and, and, and talk to folks in the public, it's still a pretty unknown technology other than it makes trinkets and toys. However, in this case, we've seen a tremendous response. And I think it, in, in one day, I barely ever get to watch the news, but I was watching it back to back stories on national news featured 3D printers mm-hmm. um, and, and how they're directly responding. I think this is going to open a lot of people, a, a lot of folks eyes to the capabilities of the technology and ultimately its play in kind of long term manufacturing, you know, community. I certainly think that um, there's going to be some great lessons learned and coming out of this on just how can we mobilize really quickly in response to these, um, you know, maybe not just a pandemic event, but like Matthew mentioned, other emergencies like hurricanes and and earthquakes is um, is to have people ready to do that. And I think that's going to be the real lasting impact here. Yeah, good. I think I'm going to second what John said. I think the change is going to be much more on awareness. Uh, I still get questions from people about when's the FDA going to clear the first 3D printed medical device. And it's like, well, boy, that was like 15 years ago. So uh, I don't think there's going to be a huge shift in the industry. I think there's going to be a much bigger shift in the awareness of where the industry is at. Could not agree more with all, all three of you. So thank you very, very much for your time, your expertise, and your willingness to, to share your insights. Uh, I've been told that we have some great virtual networking opportunities coming up. So I'm now going to turn this back over to uh, Tara and Janet. So I'll let them take it from here. And thank you all for your attention. We appreciate it. Well, Thank you again, John, Terry, Megan, Beth, Matthew, and Tara for putting this together. We're super excited that we can help um, sponsor the digital state, the digital stage, and also the digital community. So, like you said, Terry, you're right. We now have upcoming um, the virtual networking area uh, to help everyone interested in enabling the COVID-19 response to gather together and. Um, share what you're working on and also some of the challenges you're trying to overcome as well. So I would like to introduce everybody to Andira Schroeder, who heads up our marketing here at Link3D, who will share a little bit about how the virtual networking happens so that you can all have a very fruitful experience. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Janet. Um, And thank you all for joining today. I've shared my screen just to show you the instructions a little bit closer. So you can expand that by clicking the arrows in the top right corner of my shared screen if you want to see a little bit closer. Um, So just before we get started, I was going to give you guys a little bit instructions. Um, So as we finish the presenter mode, we will be in the networking session where you will be able to see tables, which act as small meeting rooms where up to six people are able to join per table and virtually network through video chat. So you can join different tables by double clicking into them. There's also five floors available and you can move between the floors by clicking on the floor numbers on the left side of the screen. So next, you can turn on your camera and mic by clicking the icons at the bottom of the screen. There's also two different um, modes where you can view the networking sessions. So if you click tile view, you can bring up the people in your table where you can see them a little bit closer and you can click back back to map um, to view the map again. And then as many of you have already been using, there's also a chat function where you can message everyone that's in the conference by using the general chat. You can message per table as well as message people individually. And then lastly, for the best experience, we recommend updating your profile. Um, So you can click the top right icon in the top right corner of your screen and add a profile picture, connect your LinkedIn, um, connect a meeting link, and then add your title and job as well. Um, And this will just help people recognize you a little bit easier um, during the virtual networking session. So thank you to everyone who's joined today. Um, Looking forward to all seeing you in the networking session.
Yep. And anyone ever interested in learning about Link 3D, we will be hanging out at the Link 3D Lounge right under the America Makes Lounge. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.